Facebook. And so everyone that's on Facebook, hi to you too as well. Um, looking, looking forward to uh, your participation as well. We do have the opportunity to take some questions from Facebook, but it'll ha you'll have to type them in the comments section um, there. Uh, Garnet, international development and human rights. What what does uh, what does your job look like in when you get a title like that? Great. Well, I am that's sort of within the ambit of our foreign policy. So we have a a lead shadow minister responsible for foreign affairs. That's Michael Chong. Uh, I work very closely with him. International development is the money that we give away internationally, or most of it. Some of it might be categorized uh, in other ways, but most of it is. Uh, is categorized international development. And we give it away uh, theoretically in hopes that uh, it uh, helps people uh, build their way out of poverty and, and become secure and, and safe and prosperous uh, and, and have their, their rights protected. So that's international development. There's some $4 billion that we give away in, in that uh, envelope. And uh, I have a lot of conversation with people about that. I, I think it, it's important for us to do what we can to advance justice and fight poverty around the world. Uh, I think sometimes, though, that that money is spent with with other goals or other political interests in mind. So uh, it's uh, important for me to really zero in on whether we're getting the, the bang for our buck, we should be in that area, uh, or, or is the government just sort of trying to curry favor with other governments around the world instead of really focusing on the well-being of, of people in a way that reflects our values. So that's international development, a lot of, lot of big issues there. And of course, with COVID-19, uh, COVID a, uh, a lot of big issues around uh, poverty and conflict and, and uh, the challenges people are experiencing as a result of that. Then international human rights, another sort of sub uh, strand of our foreign policy is Canada's voice in the world uh, speaking up for international human rights, uh, fighting for uh, for justice and uh, you know challenging other countries on their human rights record, putting in place sanctions. Uh, and uh, it, it's nice for me to have this dual role because I, I really believe in the synergies between these things as well. You know, a lot of poverty around the world is linked to injustice. It's linked to the fact that people don't have uh, the, the freedom to develop their own capabilities. Uh, they, they face violence. They're victims of, of uh, you know, being caught in the crossfire of, of conflicts. So if, if we address the human rights issues, uh, in, in many cases, that is key to also addressing the development issues, and it's a longer term term change. If we um, if we're simply focused on giving people resources, uh, that doesn't change their condition nearly as much as addressing underlying dynamics of uh, of injustice, uh, lack of protection for their for their property, for example, other forms of injustice that prevent uh, development. So. So this is an important area as part of our foreign policy, uh, and there's there's many different issues that are connected with it. I um, I serve on the Foreign Affairs Committee and I'm the vice chair of the Canada China Relations Committee, uh, and uh, work very closely with Michael Chong, our our lead uh, person on foreign affairs, as well as uh, as other colleagues on those committees. Well, thanks, Garnet. The China Committee that's uh, that's a unique unique place to be these days um so one of the things that we were going to talk about tonight is is the china file um can you just tell us a little bit about this committee that you're on and what are the the big sticking points that we have with china in terms of our relationship with them yeah so uh there are a certain set of standing committees that regularly sit and they sit in every parliament arnold you're on the indigenous affairs uh, committee, right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Okay. North, Northern and Indigenous Affairs. Northern Indigenous Affairs. So that, that's a standing committee that exists in every parliament. Uh, at the beginning of this parliament, uniquely, as a result of many of the different challenges in the Canada-China relationship and kind of the, the change in global dynamics around uh, the Xi Jinping regime trying to exercise more influence in the world and the implications for Canada of that, Conservatives put forward an opposition motion saying we should have a special committee in this parliament focused on Canada-China relations. Uh, the Liberals opposed the creation of that special committee, but uh, the dynamics of the minority are such that we were able to get the support of the Bloc and the NDP, and therefore this committee was created. Uh, so this is a, 
a, a unique committee for this parliament and it responds to the specific challenges in, 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 in the relationship. And the committee is cross-cutting. I mean, we're talking about national security issues related to China. We're talking about human rights. We're talking, of course, it's, it's a foreign affairs issue. Uh, there's also immigration issues. We're just doing a study on the situation in Hong Kong and what's our response in terms of uh, immigration policy uh, and, and uh, protecting Canadians who are, who are there as well. So, um, you know, in, in general, if I can just frame this, this issue of, of uh, the role of the government of China in the world, um, uh, and I'll, maybe I'll start this by saying, um, you know, I, I feel a great love for uh, Chinese culture, Chinese uh, philosophy, um, and I, um, you know, despite my frequent vocal criticisms of the Chinese government, uh, you know, I think there's a there's a lot to to love and admire about Chinese civilization. Um, I, I also believe that the the current leadership. Uh, Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party in, in particular. Uh, and, and, and this isn't new for the Communist Party in terms of some of the, the policies they're pursuing, uh, but it's it's reached a particular pitch uh, under under Xi Jinping. Um, it, you know, pr presents a real threat to our values. Uh, the, the, the Xi Jinping uh, regime is trying to set up a, an, an alternative political model and really evangelize about that model uh, to the rest of the world and trying to to exercise its own influence uh, over over more and more countries. Uh, and this is a, uh, you know, it, it is it is not communist in the sort of narrowly economic sense of not allowing private enterprise. You, you have forms of quote unquote private enterprise in China, but but it is communist in the sense of of highly uh, controlled one party structure. So even private companies uh, of a certain size and scale have uh, party committees within them. And effectively, those party committees dominate what those companies are doing. So you have a you have a high degree of control exercised by the Communist Party. Uh, and that's not just inside of China, either. You, you have now the effort to to export this model of you know facially private enterprises facially independent institutions but the communist party controlling them from behind you have an ex effort to in a sense extend that model beyond china's borders where the communist party is trying to infiltrate uh, institutions and, and entities beyond china's borders and exercise the same degree of influence and control. And uh, we've done some work at the committee looking at issues of what they call elite capture uh, and foreign intimidation in Canada, where the Communist Party, uh, through uh, the United Front and Works Department and other arms of the par party, are here in Canada trying to co-opt and control Canadian institutions uh, and uh, also threatening and intimidating people who are speaking out against them. Um, I'll just, just close on this point here that the, the number one security threat to Canada right now uh, is is no longer terrorism. It's foreign state-backed uh, subversion and control. Uh, it's not. Uh, I mean, we, we still need to think about issues of terrorism, uh, non-state actors that are that are uh, undertaking acts of violence. But a bigger threat to our to our security, I believe, is w uh, the efforts of states. Uh, not to not to break or destroy things, but to subvert them and control them and direct them uh, towards towards their objectives. Yeah, I, I remember it early on when I got elected, uh, there were someone was telling me about there was like a merger. I think it was like or there was a company that wanted to buy a Canadian concrete company, and the Canadian government said to this Chinese company that wanted to buy them, they said we don't. We're 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 not really excited about this deal because your the corporate structure of your company we we just think it's kind of a shell company we we like um, we don't really like how it looks and the uh, the Chinese official that was sitting across the table said well well how would you like it to look like we, we can build this corporation however you would like it mm. uh, this is kind of an interesting where they they were in it was basically a state owned company that was trying to buy Canadian assets. And they were willing to build whatever they needed to buy it. Um, hmm. It was kind of an interesting, interesting story. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's and, there, and there's so many stories like that, and, and so many different issues. I see uh, someone's posting a question about the the detention of Canadians in China. Uh, I mean, that's obviously a key issue in in the relationship. Uh, we see the efforts of the Chinese government to extend its control over over. Uh, uh, countries in, in in other parts of Asia and, and and Africa through what it calls the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, 
there's the there's the horrific human rights record, not only in China, but also uh, the regimes that enables beyond its borders who are who are also abusing human rights. There was, you know, there was a time when there was this kind of peer pressure on countries to do better on human rights because sort of the community of nations uh, was pulling in one direction. And uh and the government of China is trying to be that kind of reverse gravitational pull saying, well, if you if you don't want to respect uh, human rights uh, in your country, if you don't want uh, to to have uh, these kinds of norms of behavior uh, pushed on you, just come over and, and be in our orbit. And, and so these are these are all kinds of of, of different issues related to uh, a, a an extreme authoritarian um quasi-communist state uh, that is now in a, in a very strong position. And we're, you know, some people have used the analogy of a new Cold War. And that analogy has, th that comparison has some limitations. You know, there, there are ways in which the current dynamic of kind of competition between China and the West is different from the Cold War uh, previously. Um, but there are definite similarities as well. And there's dimensions of of technological competition, ideological competition, and uh, competition for influence in, uh, in in kind of more in between or non-aligned countries. Yeah, and, and that's always fascinating to me is that uh, you and I are from relatively the middle of the country. We're a long ways from the Canadian border. Um, yeah, we're also very long ways from China, uh, but it, w folks from Northern Alberta are still animated by uh, the relationship with China and and how how we interact with them, um, we we do a lot of trade with them. But there, there's something more philosophical about why why folks from the middle of the country, why you and I um, care about this stuff. Uh, I don't know if there if you've got more to say about that or like yeah, the... uh, absolutely. So so I mean, I think there's a few issues here. Um, uh, number one, for people I talk to about this issue, it's values, right? Uh, I think sometimes we make we make a mistake if we think people's engagement with politics is primarily about their interests. So how can how can I get a little bit more money, right? Uh, you know, people think about their interest in politics, obviously. But I think uh, as as we are as human beings, we are we are meaning seeking creatures. Uh, we are we are animated by our values, um, and even even when you're far away, even if you don't know anybody directly implicated, uh, when you hear about, uh, as, as we talked about this week, the, the genocide of the Uyghur people, uh, just horrific atrocities being, uh, being uh, done towards people simply on the basis of their ethnicity and their faith. Um, you know, things, things I, you know, I'm, I'm cautious even speaking about, but pe people can see the, the systems of, of sexual violence that are, uh, that are, that are constant uh, towards, towards women as, as part of a policy of birth, birth suppression. Um, you know, we, we, we hear those and, and it's the, the tie of common humanity that makes, I think, uh, people in your constituency and mine saying we have to do something about it. And even if it costs us something economically, we have to do something about it uh, because because it's the right thing to do. So 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 the values issue is number one. There's also a security issue. Uh, I think people are, are are waking up to this threat of foreign state backed interference in Canada, how it threatens our our sovereignty, uh, how it, uh, it it threatens our our. Uh, our, our well-being as a nation in the long term, and uh, it, it threatens our, our rights and freedoms. And already we hear stories of, you know, many people whose rights and freedoms have been threatened here in Canada. Often they're people that are at the forefront of, of speaking and writing about these issues. Uh, and, I, and I've uh, put forward a motion on this, Motion 55 in the House, to, to try and get the government to do more to protect people who are victims of foreign state-backed interference. Uh, people... Um, People like Chimi Lamo, a, a Tibetan student activist in Toronto, uh, who who uh, ha, was was just bombarded by uh, by what looks like an organized campaign from the Chinese consulate of intimidation and threats of violence. Okay, I, so, so, so and then and then I sorry, there's there's the values dimension, there's a the security dimension, and there is the economic interest dimension as well. In that you know when we when we're in such a position of strategic dependency on China. Uh, when when some of our elites tell us for a while, oh, this is the future of our economy, relationship with China, and then we become vulnerable to their whims when they want to just kind of pull it back, and then we 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 lose that that access. You know, it's a big problem for us economically as well. The uh, and the solution is to strengthen our relationship with other markets to to build up um, 
to build up other kinds of, of uh, trade partnerships so that we can, we can be engaged economically with China. We could try to influence them in, in the process, but we cannot be dependent on China. We need to have uh, alternative uh, markets to, to access. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other examples of this like st um, foreign in state interference? Uh, like uh, like that, that's something I think that's kind of far away from my life anyways. I like, I don't, um, I don't see China interfering anywhere in my life, but like, what, what does that look like? You, you talk about this student in, in, in the school there, he gets bombarded. Um, can you flesh that out a little bit more? Yeah. So, uh, when, when we launched motion 55 as a, as a private members initiative, uh, we had four people who were victims of foreign state backed interference. Uh, two of them, it was involving China and, and, uh, two of them involving, uh, other countries. Uh, one of them, the gentleman, uh, I think he lives in Edmonton. His wife was killed when the, this was, this is related to Iran, not China, but, uh, you, Folks will recall the, the the terrible event where a, where a plane with many Canadians on was was shot down, leaving Iran. And uh, uh, the husband of a lady who was killed uh, in in that uh, shooting down of uh, of that flight, uh, he became vocally critical of the IRGC, the the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, which is kind of a, a tool of violence by the Iranian regime. And he. You know, just, just having gone through this tragedy, speaking out of, about the need for, for justice uh, for, for his wife, uh, started to experience these threats from the from the uh, Iranian government. You know, it, it, they you know, for, first he loses his wife and then he, he, he's still experiencing, uh, you know, further threats and violence towards him. Uh, so these, these examples, you know, they're they're imminent. They're, they're people in our communities, in our neighborhoods. Uh, they're people who are who are here in Canada. Uh, who have their rights and freedoms threatened? It's you know it, it is especially an issue for people uh, who uh, you know they may have family members uh, back in a in a country of origin somewhere else. Uh, they may have economic connections uh, elsewhere. Um, you know, but but there are there are other ways in which this influence uh, plays out. Uh, there's there's big concern about efforts to to influence uh, discussion on university campuses. Uh, where there are, are threats against students, there's monitoring of of, uh, of students reporting back to embassies. People, you know, if you have Chinese international students at certain events, they might get uh, get criticized by by uh, the government or family members of theirs might be at, at risk back home. Uh, so these, these are, are are real issues in Canada, and again, they're they are threats to our sovereignty that we have to be aware of. All right, uh, we had um, yeah. The last couple of weeks here have been uh, a lot of a lot of things have been moving and, and shifting. And last week we had a a, we, a motion on the genocide of the Uyghurs, and that made quite a bit of news uh, here in Alberta. It's been making news around the world, or uh, here in Canada, but it's been making news around the world for a number of years now. I I, uh, I subscribe to a magazine called World Magazine, and they've been covering the treatment of the Uyghurs for. I want to say three or four years, maybe maybe a little bit longer, um, and and I I have presented petitions around this as his view, um, but it, maybe you can just explain a little bit the situation and what happened last week and then early this week. Yeah, so uh, we we have these opposition days periodically, which are opportunities for members of the opposition to put forward. Uh, for, for opposition parties to be able to put forward motions, which are then debated and voted on. So on Thursday, we had a debate on recognizing uh, that Uyghurs uh, are subject to an ongoing genocide. Uh, and this is in response to, to Canada's obligations under uh, the Genocide Convention to recognize when uh, a, a, another state or other actors are trying to eradicate a people in whole or in part through through various mechanisms that are laid out in the convention. Now the data is very clear that genocide is happening. Uh, and again, I, I'd encourage those who who want to really de delve into the details to look at some of the the articles online 
uh, about this and, and you can see that you know the the concentration camps largest mass detention of a minority community since the holocaust we have the satellite imagery of people being uh, taken away on trains just like uh, just like happened during the second world war um, and uh, we have the testimony of survivors who talk about the the systemic campaigns of forced abortion, forced sterilization, forced insertion of IUDs, and, and we have in in the data that's come out of uh, birth rates uh, among Uyghurs just a precipitous drop. Uh, so so there's there's the, the horrific conditions of concentration camp. The primary mechanism of this genocide, it seems to me, uh, is the efforts to prevent births within the within the group. So destroying a people by present preventing. Uyghur women from being able to to have babies. So uh, we need to to call this out. And this is really uh, Arnold. I mean, I think this is the the becoming the core of the moral case against the Chinese Communist Party. Um, once people see and understand what is happening to Uyghurs, um, they start to understand what this regime is capable of. What it's capable of towards Uyghurs is the same thing that it's capable of. Uh, towards people in other parts of China, towards people in Hong Kong, and towards people uh, who are beyond uh, China's borders. Once, once we understand uh, what we're dealing with in terms of that regime, it should uh, really strengthen our perception of reality in, in our own interactions. So we're calling on the government of Canada to recognize that reality. And then we had a vote on, uh, on Monday, which is uh, yesterday, um, lose track of the time here. Lots is going on. Uh, we had a vote yesterday on it, and uh, the, up to then the government had had refused to recognize this genocide. So we just sort of assumed they would vote against it. In the end, the political pressure was so strong from Canadians who were speaking out about this issue that the cabinet abstained, uh, which is a you know really strange move. You know they 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 they're not sure. You know is it a genocide or not? Well, we just we we'll just miss the vote. You know that's. That's that's not leadership, needless to say, but that's uh, that's what they did. And m many liberal MPs, though not all backbench liberal MPs, there were many backbench M liberal MPs that abstained as well. But uh, but many liberal MPs voted for it. As well. So 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 in the end, it was unanimous in the sense that everybody who showed up to vote voted for the motion, which was a great success. Uh, Canada is now the first democratic legislature in the world to recognize this. The United States uh, administration has recognized it. The, the, the administration of President Trump and then President Biden both recognized the genocide. Uh, but this is the first time that, that recognition has taken place through a vote of a, of a, of a legislature. And uh, it's, a, it's a big step forward. Um, but, but, you know, it's, it's far from the end of it. You know, we, recognizing reality is the first step. Uh, and the next steps need to be other strong policy responses to uh, to protect uh, the weaker people, to fulfill our obligations to, to combat this genocide. Uh, that means Magnitsky sanctions, targeted sanctions against those who are uh, who are enacting this genocide. And then also, uh, secondly, we need to reform our, our supply chains. And uh, this is a, a kind of a neat synergy between Arnold, the work you've been doing and the work that I've been doing. Uh, Arnold does a, you know, I'm sure many of you who are who are watching this know Arnold does a lot of work around uh, human trafficking, slavery, uh, both human trafficking domestically and abroad. And part of what's happening to Uyghurs is that uh, that Uyghurs are being forced into slave labor. There's a great deal of slave labor producing products that may uh, end up in in our markets here in Canada. So we need supply chain reforms uh, that prevent uh, for products made from forced labor from coming into our markets. And this is something that I know, Arnold, you've been working on under the sort of ambit of human trafficking and that I've been working about under the ambit of the Uyghur, Uyghur work. So, um, you know, finally, I just wanted to say, you know, are, you passed that motion to have February 22nd recognized as Human Trafficking Awareness Day. And I thought it was a, a real powerful coming together of these kind of areas of our work that it was on Human Trafficking Awareness Day that the House of Commons recognized uh, the Uyghur genocide, which is, which is, you know, in terms of, of scale, uh, I'm sure the largest sort of operation of, of uh, certainly of state run human trafficking uh, anywhere, Mo most places in the world, human trafficking happens kind of um, outside of the law, but this is a case of state organized human trafficking and we're recognizing that reality on the same day that we've marked for human trafficking awareness. So th these are great steps in terms of awareness, but now we need to respond by putting in place the policies to make sure that we are no longer importing products made through slave labor. Yeah, the, the one other thing that um, I've presented many petitions on and I've, 
uh, there's a gentleman here in Ottawa. Um, he's a former member of parliament, I think from Edmonton. His name is David Kilgore. Um, and he has really shone the light on the organ harvesting that takes place, uh, the illegal organ harvesting that takes place in China. Um, it, the Falun Gong people are very much targeted by that. Uh, that's another group of people in China. But I, I understand as well the Uyghur uh, ish, the Uyghur population is also um, being forced to to donate their organs. Is is that yeah? True? So so for, forced organ harvesting and trafficking is is another just you know absolutely horrific um, thing that the government of China is is doing and has been doing for for a long time. Where where uh, Fa Falun Gong practitioners they practice a sort of quasi spiritual uh, uh, movement um, that are, has faced severe persecution in China. Uh, Falun Gong practitioners are are being killed for their organs. And those organs are then being uh, transplanted to or sold uh, to other people. And one of the steps we've tried to take this on this is address the reality that Canadians may be going abroad to receive organs that have been taken through this kind of forced organ harvesting. So uh, we have we have been working on legislation to make it a criminal offense for a person to go abroad and receive an organ that was taken without consent. Uh, this is a bill that I tabled in the House of Commons in the last parliament. Um, we, we figured out that the best way to get it moving was to work with someone in the Senate and Senator Salma Tulajan, conservative senator, great champion of human rights, put this bill forward in the last parliament in this parliament, it's bill S204. I would love to see it, this bill get passed in this parliament. Unfortunately, um, the parliament's barely sat, so it, it, it's going to be a little bit of a challenging to get it through all the hoops it needs to in this parliament. But, uh, you know, who knows? It's always it's dependent on kind of when the when the election is, uh, which is which everyone everyone's guess changes from minute to minute here. Um, so yeah, Falun, Falun Gong practitioners have have been a primary victim for decades of this and have been at the forefront of the advocacy around legislation to combat forced organ harvesting and trafficking. Uh, but now we see that Uyghurs, uh, Uyghurs are, are being victims of this as well. I uh, can't talk about Canada-China relations without mentioning uh, Huawei. Um, mm -hmm. That's a tech company that uh, sells lots of technology into Canada. Um, folks are suspicious that the technology has got a back door into it so that wherever this technology is, the CCP, the Chinese Par Communist Party, um, can access it. Uh, that, that seems to be verified. Uh, however, um, the our, our Canadian government uh, has not, the Liberal government has not made a decision on that yet. I think there was a, can you explain that a little bit? There was a motion yeah. as well around that, but. Yeah, so I mean, the, the the government of Canada is funding research partnerships with Huawei. Like it's it's just crazy, right? Like the 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 first step here is do no harm, right? Like don't don't fund it, right? Like that's that should be fairly basic, right? Um, and and it, it's really odd with this government when it comes to China, the current current Liberal government, because their their instinct has always been to be be very weak on these issues uh it goes back to this history of the liberal party with pierre trudeau and uh, you know you know his his interactions with mao and um you know the idea that the liberal party has this nuanced sophisticated uh, pro uh, you know uh, pro pro engagement with the chinese leadership that's kind of the, the way they tell the story um but they understand now that public opinion is just is just completely on the other side. The public is, you know, the public is seeing what's going on and, and is is overwhelmingly, uh, you know, and rightly hostile to the agenda of the CCP. Not not hostile to China as such, but hostile to what the government of China is doing, the policy they're pursuing. So the liberals are trying to look stronger and tougher on this stuff, and yet they have these. And yet they can't help themselves at the same time, right? So they'll they'll develop this tougher rhetoric about, oh, we recognize China has changed, and then, you know, five minutes later we find out about them funding this research partnership with Huawei. So, so you know, they're and on some of these points they're really caught in indecision, which is what we see saw on the Uyghur genocide. That you know, no policy, abstaining. Um, they're they're trying to do the equivalent of abstaining on this Huawei issue. It looks like by by not making a decision, even though the House of Commons passed a motion calling on them to make a decision, they're uh, uh, they're not making a decision, 
and uh, so you know, so here here we are in this uh, uh, kind of um, undefined point. Four of our five key uh, Five Eyes allies, uh, Australia, New Zealand, the United States, and the UK, uh, have said no to Huawei. Uh, Canada is still deciding. Apparently, it's uh, you know, it's 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 a it's a really strange place we are here. The government, um, you know. Not not wanting to to be criticized publicly because they know where the public is at on China, but at the same time conflicted between that political imperative and uh, you know their own instincts, which is to be to be weak on these issues. Yeah, all right, well, uh, folks, I've got a, a number of questions here. Um, uh, Ken, uh, I see you got a question in the Q and A here. I I don't know if you're interested to come on and ask it, or I, I can just read it out, but. Uh... Mr. Vanderwell. Yeah. Go, go ahead and read it out there, Arnold. All right, I'll do that. So, um, it, it can, in connected to the Huawei uh, question here, um, we're we're we've been holding uh, an executive of Huawei uh, for a number of years. Um, how has that affected our relationship, and will that change? given the administration in the United States uh, change that has happened there? Um, yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's a good question. I mean, uh, the, uh, Meng Wanzhou was, was, uh, was arrested on a, on an international arrest warrant, Canada adhering to our international obligations. And um, you know our, it's it's important for us to to be committed and demonstrate our commitment to the rule of law. Um, and if the circumstances change in some way in the United States, uh, you know, then then uh, potentially our obligations there change. But it's it's just important for Canada to always send the message that we are committed to the rule of law and. Um, you know, China engaged in this policy of arbitrary detention to try and extract concessions from other countries, uh, hostage taking, really. And it's just important to say that we, we don't address the hostage taking issue by giving in or limiting our action in response to, to that hostage taking. Because if we do that, then no Canadian is safe, right? Then other countries will will pursue this policy. China will ramp this policy up uh, up more. Uh, it's it's an invitation to to other governments to engage this policy to China to continue to engage in this policy if we make concessions in response to this policy. All right, and there's a number of questions that have come up around uh, the two Michaels. Um, I just, if you want to like outline how we ended up in this situation with yeah. having two Canadian citizens in jail for hundreds of days yeah. now. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I do think it's important for people to know as well. Like these are the cases people are most familiar with. There are other Canadian citizens who are uh, who are imprisoned in China. There's the case of Hussein Jalil, who's been in in prison in China for over a decade and a half. He's a Uyghur activist. Uh, and he wasn't actually arrested in China. He was in Uzbekistan, and he was uh, he was taken from Uzbekistan and extradited to to uh, I mean extradited probably overstated. He was he was he was he was kidnapped and sent to China. And his whereabouts is unknown. He hasn't had consular access. Uh, he's got a, a wife here in Canada and four sons, the youngest of whom uh, has never met his father because his mother was pregnant uh, when uh, when he was arrested. Um, so there's a case of the two Michaels, obviously. Uh, there have been other cases of Canadians detained. There's uh, there's uh, the Schellenberger case. There's Fan Wei. There's... Um, what, what what do we what do we do in response uh, to to this policy of the government of China, whereby people are kidnapped who are Canadian citizens, international norms, international laws not respected with regard to their treatment or often with regard to consular access, uh, and it's it's designed to get uh, Canada to make concessions. Well, I can tell you, uh, w w if if we appear weak, if we appear uh, vulnerable to this kind of tactic, then we will not do anything good for the people in this situation. Because if our response to hostage taking is concessions, then more Canadians will be taken hostage. 
uh, those in China, people perhaps in in other countries who have uh, who are nearby or who have friendly relations with China, as as happened with Uzbekistan. So um, we need to to deter this behavior. That's uh, that's that's what I would propose as a response, uh, which is to to make absolutely clear that this policy is unacceptable. It will not lead to concessions. In fact, it will lead to to us taking a stronger stand, calling out uh, the Chinese government uh, for this and other other kinds of behavior. And uh, I think what you saw with the weaker genocide vote, for example, is parliamentarians saying, we're not gonna be intimidated by this kind of hostage taking as a tool to get us to, to change our policy. Um, you know, if anything, through the detention of the two Michaels, more and more Canadians are um, are becoming aware of what the government of China uh, is all about, is capable of. And I, and I think, you know, when 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 the government of China does that, it it ultimately is a counterproductive uh, tactic because the the it it undermines their international reputation. The public responds negatively to them, and that's I think what we're seeing happening. Uh, I think we'll uh, we'll go to the um, basically the open mic. I if you want to ask uh, Garnet or myself a question, uh, just raise your hand if you're on the on the Zoom call. Um, Facebook, um, unfortunately, uh, uh, you'll have to register for my my next uh, town hall like this. But uh, nonetheless, I've got uh, three hands up here already. Um, yeah, you'll have to probably unmute yourself um, as we as I ask you to come up there. So we got uh, Cam. Uh, Cam, if you wanna ask your question. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I am, uh, my name is Kayum and I'm uh, from Uyghur uh, Rights Advocacy Group based in Ottawa. So I would, I cannot thank you enough, our, all the elected MPs for voting yesterday. And you know, this is very uh, tremendous day not only for Canadians, but for the Uyghurs as well, you know, it's, uh, and this, it, it sent very uh, big sh shockwave, you know, around the world, especially okay. in Muslim majority uh, states. Well, thank you. Uh, thank my, you for my, joining my, us and, today. Yes, yeah, thank you. And my question would be, uh, how soon or uh, would we be inspecting any anytime uh, feasible concrete actions uh, from the part of the government once this um, genocide recognition uh, has uh, is passed, you know, what would would we be normal, um, realistic to expect any uh, tangible results like anytime soon? And a follow up question: Can can we think about resettling Uyghur refugees from the third party countries, like on the same scale as like Syrians, uh, Yazidis, and uh, Rohingya refugees? You know, anything can be done on that. Thank you. Thanks, Cam. Garnet, do you? Want to respond to that one? Yes, uh, absolutely. So uh, I'll just go in reverse order on on the question of uh, resettlement or asylum, um, and um, you know, of, of course, as, as you pointed out, this is a question for Uyghurs who are in in third countries who have been able to leave China, uh, but are, but have not been able to permanently settle, uh, and maybe maybe in fact vulnerable in the country they've uh, they've escaped to, um, you know, because. Uyghurs who are in China, you know, will have a hard time getting out. Um, so yes, I mean, this is this is definitely something we need to look at as as a response. Um, yeah, I, uh, I I tend to to really uh, favor the the private refugee sponsorship uh, channel as being an effective way of bringing people in vulnerable situations here. It it supports uh, their their. Uh, you know their their connection, their integration here in Canada, and I think there's there's a growing awareness of of the Uyghur situation. There would be a great deal of interest in uh, different groups in Canada stepping up to engage in that private private sponsor uh, channel. Uh, unfortunately, what we see with the government now is the the and and some of the other people on this call may be familiar with this if they've been involved in refugee sponsorship work that that we're seeing the piling on of red tape on private refugee sponsors that's creating a lot of Real challenges for those who who want to do this work. Um, so there's there's I think more more work that needs to be done there, and it needs to be part of the conversation. In terms of what the government uh, is going to do, I mean, look, there's a separation right between the legislature, which was what Arnold and I are part of, and the government, which is effectively the cabinet. And um, our our role as legislators is passing legislation and also advocacy through motions and and and, and other uh, forums. So. Um, 
one concrete response would be to pass legislation like Bill S-216, uh, which is a, a bill that I know Arnold knows a, a, a lot about. Uh, it's, it was, I think, a, was it an initiative of the uh, all-party group on modern-day slavery, Arnold? Yeah, so it, originally it started with uh, John McKay, a Liberal member. Uh, it's supply chain reporting, so um, basically yeah. making sure that the things that we buy in Canada aren't being produced with slave labor. Um, yeah, so, so that's that 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 would be one important part of the response to Magnitsky. Pardon me to uh, to the Uyghur genocide. Uh, Magnitsky sanctions are important, but many of these things, uh, you know, they require government buy-in. You you can get a private member's bill theoretically through the House of Commons and the Senate without government support, but it's very difficult and it takes a long time, and we probably don't have enough time to do it. Um, what we need to see is a government bill on this issue. We'd like to see initiatives like 216 become a government bill so they can move quickly. Uh, uh, certainly Magnitsky sanctions is totally within the purview of the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Um, so so we, we need the government to recognize this genocide and the government to act. And we'll continue putting the pressure on as a legislature, but uh, that, that only goes so far if the government is unwilling to take the steps that should uh, come out of it. Um, Irvin. You can unmute your mic there, Irvin, and then uh, ask your question. Okay. Uh, it occurs to me that about 40 years ago, China involved itself with its one-child policy. And as a one-child policy, then it actually sanctioned the uh, uh, abortion and the murder of any child or many children who weren't males, because the culture of China is that if you can only have one child, you want a male to look after you in your old age. So that being the case then, China has had no bones about actually uh, uh, can, you know, doing all of this stuff against its own population. Now, supposedly, they have a, a shortage of labor. And, uh, and uh, how, how does all that work out with what we're seeing China's belligerence in the areas around it now? Thanks, Irvin. Well, I, I think you've identified a, a number of different questions, um, you know, and, and I guess you're asking about connections between them. I mean, conceptually, I, I think they're, they're sort of separate issues. Like uh, the, the one child policy was a, was a great evil um, and I, th I think it's important to, to, to say that 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 it was it was a great evil um, because you know you you, you still have um, some individuals on on the political left uh, that will will um, maybe not quite explicitly endorse it in all its forms but but ex but express sort of positive things about about the objective or you know when you uh, this is it, it, it was a it was a uh, an evil form of structured violence uh, that, um, that that led to the to the uh, as as you talked about to the deaths of uh, of many children. Um, I, I think in, in part as a result of that, um, there's there's a question about uh, sort of demographics in in China that you have an aging population and uh, that. Chinese economic growth uh, is not uh, sustainable in the long term for a variety of reasons, but in you know demographics being a key part of it. So there's speculation about what the implications of that will be, you know, over the next few decades as sort of the full aging of that uh, population um, kind of comes comes to a comes to a head. Um, we do we do see a lot of sort of aggressive action. Uh, by the uh, by, the Chinese state in in the sort of area around China, uh, kind of a, an aggressive posture in the South China Sea, um, but further afield as well. I guess one thing we haven't talked about is uh, uh, Chinese government policy in the Arctic. The government of China is now saying that China is a is a near Arctic power, and is trying to exercise control and influence in the Arctic, which is a, a major issue for Canada and one of the things we need to to wake up to is the security threats in our uh, in our far north. So, so many issues raised by your questions, uh, for sure. Ken. 
Great. Uh, thank you for uh, putting this on, uh, Arnold and uh, Garnett. So my my question, uh, so you were just mentioning the Canadian Arctic. I had heard and read that the Canadian government... Well, can you just went mute on us? Okay, can you hear me now? We can hear you again, yes. Okay, that uh, the Canadian government was actually uh, having... Chinese soldiers on the West Coast and training them in cold weather uh, activity. Can you speak to that? The other thing that I'm concerned about, if we're going to try to put pressure on China for the um, human uh, genocides that they've done, uh, can you speak to the Olympic Games coming up and our athletes going to them? I know China had indicated any countries that are going to be um, uh, not attending the, the games would be dealt with severely. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly what that means. Just your comments on it. Well, I, I guess I can just, I have signed a letter uh, asking the government to consider um, participating in the Olympics in another venue, um, not in China. Uh, I signed this letter with a number of members from different parties. Um, and so that 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 is out there. Um, I know that our motion that we passed on Monday also referenced that as well, that we moved the Olympics. Um, but yeah, the, what the ramifications are that we, I guess we'll wait and see. Garnet, I don't know if you've got any idea as to where that might go. Yeah, well, so there there was an uh, an amendment to our genocide motion that uh, that called for the relocation of the Olympic Games. And so that was part of the motion that passed 266 to zero with the prime minister of the cabinet abstaining. Um, so that's a, a statement from Canada's parliament. And, uh, you know, we'll see how, what the response is to that. Um, I, I think there, if, if the Olympics proceed in China, there will be many countries that will not participate. Um, I think it will, it will, um, it will be an important moment for the world in terms of how they respond. Uh, but, but Canada won't, I think, be the only one. Uh, and I just put, put the Olympics in, in perspective, right? And in, in 1936, uh, the Olympics were held in Berlin. And this was a huge sort of propaganda victory for the Nazi regime. And a lot of people are in retrospect sort of critical of those who participated in the 1936 Olympics. Remember, though, in 1936, we didn't know about the concentration camps. We hadn't seen the images. Uh, we, we, we didn't have a full sense of, of how far that evil would go. The difference between the 1936 Olympics and the 2022 Olympics is that today we know about the concentration camps. We can see and have seen uh, the images, the, uh, the satellite footage of people being loaded up in, in train cars and taken away. Uh, so this is a sort of stark moral question. And uh, when I hear, you know, a liberal MP, former Olympic athlete himself saying, well, we don't want to hurt the athletes. You know, I, I would say sport, sports are for fun, um, but fundamental human rights and human dignity come first. You know, if, if, if I was in a track and field meet and I saw somebody fighting for their life on the sidelines, I would stop running and do what I could to help them. Um, same, same, same principle applies here. Human life, human dignity ahead of, uh, ahead of uh, sporting competitions. Henry, if you can unmute your mic there and ask your question. Hi, Garnet. Uh, there's a tremendous uh, amount of distrust in uh, Canada, at least I think in Western Canada, for the uh, Chinese. Uh, there's probably about an equal amount of distrust in Western Canada for our liberal government. Um, uh, you talk about the liberals and you say that they're weak in, in these regards. Um, do you think it's just simply a question of weakness or do you think there's anything more sinister behind uh the actions of this trudeau government thanks by the way guys for the work that you both do 
Um, I mean, like if the implications if the, of the question is, do I think, you know, uh, someone's on the take or, or you know, no, I mean, I, th I think the issue with the prime minister is bad judgment and uh, a real naivety with respect to, uh, to China. Um, I mean, I, 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 given the benefit of the doubt, I, I do think he's doing what he, he believes is right. Um, but, but I think, you know, we, we see a level of, um, of unwillingness to stand up and, and have the kind of strength that we would expect from a leader. That, and that's, that's really been missing here. And, and uh, it's, you know, for the sake of our country, our sovereignty, our institutions, our values, uh, we need that strength in a leader. Oh, I'm just, Carolyn, are you are you there? Would you like to ask a question? Thank you very much. Thank you both, uh, Garrett and uh, Arnold. I think that Ottawa has gotten so globally focused that we forgot about our own home. Uh, we still have, uh, you know, Prime Minister um, Harper. He instituted a uh, audit on all First Nation books. The first thing Trudeau did was stop that. Then, um, you know, we have nation and First Nations that still don't have water and good housing. We still have our own group of, you know, people that are under the gun, yet we can afford to send billions overseas to fight everybody else's issues, but we can't. Where is the support for home? I, I just feel that we've gotten too global and we have forgot about Canada. We need help. The West needs help. And, you know, I mean, the leader of the PC party and himself, I mean, Aaron O'Toole, I, you know, you hardly see him. He doesn't stand up for whatever. And I'm hoping that the election doesn't come anytime soon because I'm afraid that that Trudeau is gonna get back in there again because he can throw money at all of these people and all they do is run to vote because they can get $2,000 a month to stay home and do shit while the rest of us are working our butts off. So. You know, I, I, I wholeheartedly do not believe that China is in any way, um, you know, a democratic country or whatever. They're evil. They, they have done bad things. And of course, there are many countries that have. But the UN hasn't helped either. They don't stand up for the rights and so on. So if you can answer a few of those questions of my rambling, good luck with that. But thank you, Arnold. And thank you, uh, Garrett, for allowing us this privilege to actually speak to you guys. Uh, it's a good venue to do, and I look forward to many more. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Carolyn. And uh, always appreciate your opinions. Uh, yeah. So, so I mean, thank you for the question. A few, a few different things in there. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm 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 one member of our caucus, and and I uh, have a certain portfolio. And of course, you know, we have point people in our caucus that are covering the full range of issues, many of which are are domestic issues, whether it's uh, indigenous affairs, uh, uh, social programs, finances, uh, uh, some of the issues that you you uh, alluded to. I, I would just make the case, you know, especially when it comes to the China file, um, for the for the interconnections between what happens internationally and the implications for us domestically here. Uh, we, we can't take our security for granted. And uh, many of the security threats that lead to acts of violence or terrorism or acts of uh, control and co-opting uh, do, do originate elsewhere. And so we need to be aware of these things and following them and uh, relating to other countries in a way that, that protects our economic security uh, that, uh, that, and that protects our physical security. Uh, that creates a world which is a safer place uh, for democratic nations. Um, we need to be attentive to trying to create a world in which, uh, you know, you, you Carolyn, or, or, or others on this call aren't, aren't vulnerable to being kidnapped if you travel abroad um, or, or subject to, to, to threats and intimidation here in Canada when you, when you express your point of view. Um, the, the, the government of China, the Chinese Communist Party has a global agenda uh, and it matters to all of us. It has implications for, for, for everybody here. Um, 
you know, and, and uh, like I, I, I studied a lot uh, growing up uh, Second World War history. My grandmother was a was a Holocaust survivor. Um, and, uh, and, and in particular, the sort of appeasement crisis of, of 1938 and 1939. This is when Hitler was um, sort of making, ten, making his initial sort of aggressive moves and countries, uh, other countries, democratic countries were trying to appease him by making deals to give him some of the things he wanted in hopes that he would, um, he would just uh, uh, you know, be satisfied with that and leave it there. Uh, and, uh, you know, ne Neville Chamberlain, who was the prime minister of the UK, kind of the champion of, of this appeasement philosophy, uh, he, he talked about, uh, you know, he referred to Czechoslovakia, which, which uh, Germany was sort of in the process of, of trying to swallow up as, as, a, as a place far away of people about whom we know nothing, you know, um, and I hear that, that sentiment echoed by some people today, oh, these, this is far away, this has nothing to do with us. Right, um, but it did have something to do with with uh, with England and with us here in Canada, uh, and the the appeasement policy, uh, and and there are many voices for that appeasement policy or for forms of isolation here. But but that appeasement, that isolation mentality, um, gave Hitler the opportunity and the time to strengthen his position, uh, and and ultimately be a be a greater threat uh, if if. Democratic countries had taken stronger positions earlier. I mean, who knows? We might have prevented war entirely, or or certainly prevented it, uh, prevented Hitler from getting to a position uh, where he could really pose an, an existential threat to so many other countries uh, in Europe. So, um, you know, and, and and you know, following the First World War, there was there was a great desire for for isolation. Let's let's focus on what's going on at home. Well. It, it, you can't lose sight of the importance of, of thinking about security, of thinking about what's happening on the world, because it does come back and, and affect us as well. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm one member of a big of a big team. Mo most of our colleagues have portfolios that relate to domestic policy, but uh, but especially as it relates to security, we we do need to be engaged internationally as well. All right, I uh, I'm out of. Oh, and I, I, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. I just and and of course, COVID nineteen, right? I mean. Uh, like it, it was, it was the, the in, in large part, it was the dishonesty of the Chinese regime in terms of not owning up earlier to the challenge of COVID-19 that allowed the virus and the global pandemic to get to the point it did. So this is, that is, I think, the clearest indication in, in the current time of how what happens in other countries uh, can have a dramatic impact on our life here. I, uh, I'm an auto mechanic from Northern Alberta and Garnet always tells me there's not a wrench big enough to fix Ottawa. Um, but one of the, one of the things I the, one of the things I usually try to do that annoys me about politicians is when they don't answer questions. And I don't know if you've watched Question Period lately, but that happens a lot. Um, but there was a question earlier, and Peter Unruh has reminded me um, about the Chinese military training, and I don't think we actually got an answer to that one. Um, he's actually is that is that legit? Is that actually happening? Um, I I know that I've read about like uh, joint. Chinese Canadian police force um, training exercise, like training that happens. Um, I, I haven't confirmed that. Um, I, I have read a news article, one news article about it, but I haven't been able to confirm it. I don't know, Garnet, if you've got any confirmation of this, like the Chinese military. I know that there's been some some rumblings about it, but uh, I think also uh, the, the Canadian military has taken some flack from the Trudeau government for not wanting to do some of this. So I don't know if you can answer that question. We missed out earlier. Ken asked. Yeah, I know. So I look. I I, I want to be careful uh, to make sure that I that I that I know the specific information uh, as as we're providing it. Um, I'll say, you know, as as members of Parliament, we don't have inside information about these these kinds of things, right? Um, you know, we we uh, the, the, these kinds of, of issues, uh, we we tend to find out, you know, the through through the same general channels that 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 others do. Um, but I, I do recall a story in which um, basically that the Chinese military. Uh, had been looking for the opportunity to to uh, 
get trained in Canada and the military had declined that and there was sort of counter pressure from the Trudeau government. Um, so I, I again, I, I, I want to be careful that that I'm I'm getting this precisely right, because I know there was discussion of this. Uh, and if I recall the story correctly, um, you know, it, it was another demonstration that the Trudeau government didn't understand or appreciate uh, the, the, the real risks here. Uh, but the military had provided some pushback to this suggestion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a story about the Vancouver. Um, I was just reading that recently, but it, it's not um, from necessarily a well known newspaper or something like that. Um, but of the Vancouver police force has a uh, program by which they take police officers from the developing world and they uh, basically partner or shadow a Canadian police officer for a couple of months at a time. And apparently there's been a number of Chinese um, police officers that have been shadowing um, police officers here in Canada. Um, I've heard that, but I like that. That is I only read one story on it and I haven't been able to collaborate it anywhere else. Um, so that's, t yeah, like Garnet says, the things that you're reading are probably the same thing we are. Um, the, the difference between you and I is that Gar Garnet and I get to uh, get asked questions in the House of Commons of the government and hopefully they can find the answers. But if you've watched question period, there's a reason it's called question period and not question and answer period. Um, nonetheless, uh, I've got a couple more. We're trying to make this a question and answer period. Um, we've got a couple more folks here on the on the call with their hand hand up. Uh, I'll go through them. So we've got Martin and Jane. Uh, Martin, if you want to unmute, um, we'll go through these last two questions. And then, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank everyone for their time here tonight. So, Martin. Okay. Um, first, uh, thank you, Granite, and honor to you. Um, have so much concern about the Hong Kong issue and helping our citizen in Hong Kong. Um, I just got a question. Actually, the question contains two parts. It's regarding to, um, we all knew that there are over 300,000 Canadian citizens uh, residing in Hong Kong now, not including their extended family. Um, recently, the Hong Kong government had not reckon, had, had unrecognized it um, their dual citizenship. Uh, first question I want to ask is, um, what does Garnet concern about? I uh, have, uh, have the concern about this situation. Is he is he agreed that like their dual citizenship should be stripped up? Second, is in the near future, what if these three hundred some thousand Canadian citizens are uh, their personal belongings, their property, their lives, their safety uh, are going to be affected by the Chinese government or the uh, Hong Kong government. Uh, how should you suggest our government would respond to that? Thank you, Martin. Yep. Uh, yes, I think I think those are those are important questions. The this, the situation in, in Hong Kong uh, is, is just just, uh, you know, horrific what the government of China has has been doing. With the national security law and, and really before that this is the national security law is really just the sort of the next step in a trajectory of of, of aggression and it, it shows a, a profound lack of respect for uh for the commitment that the government of china has has made you know signing an agreement uh around the the handover and then not respecting that at all um so just in terms of the question you asked about uh canadian citizens there uh it is it, it is very clear to to us as as canadians of course that that, that those are canadian citizens um the, the government of china does not respect canadian citizenship unfortunately in many cases and has a track record of misapplying their own legal framework with respect to dual citizenship so so chinese law says you know if you if you take on another citizenship you you lose your your Chinese citizenship, um, but there are people that have become Canadian citizens who are still treated, you know, if they're detained as if they are Chinese citizens and, and Chinese citizens only. Um, so, from the Canadian perspective, of course, uh, folks in that situation remain Canadian citizens. But from the, the Chinese government perspective, uh, I mean, I think it's fair to say that 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 they that they will continue to 
uh, apply these doctrines selectively, you know, rule by law, not rule of law, right, is, is kind of how they, how, how this regime thinks and operates. Um, we had hearings at the Canada-China Committee on the Hong Kong issue, and, and someone made a comment about the risk of, quote, thousands of Michaels in Hong Kong, which, which was really sort of a startling concept to us that, that we could go from the situation where we have a handful of Canadians arbitrarily detained to a situation where, where a much larger scale number could be could be prevented from from leaving could be eff effectively detained in that sense. So uh, how, how would Canada respond? Uh, well, I think I think we already need to be preparing for the scenario in which there's escalating bad behavior by the Chinese regime uh, by having collaboration with our allies to try to uh, deter these kinds of actions, uh, targeted sanctions, um, uh, symbolic things like like relocating the Olympics, uh, uh, economic measures that respond to to economic measures, uh, t taking taking the position that bad behavior by the Chinese government will lead to consequences rather than kind of taking the deer in the headlights lights approach. Uh, we need strength and we need coordination to deter bad behavior. Jane, I think we'll, this will be our last question there. Jane, if you can unmute your mic. Hi, thank you, Mr. Um, Genius. And um, Mr. Uh, I will call you uh, um, Arnold for doing this uh, town hall. Um, I have a couple of questions about uh, what you have, what you two have been covered uh, uh, earlier this tonight. Uh, the first of all, uh, for um, Mr. Genius is that, um, you keep mentioning that your grandma is uh, the Holocaust survivor. And I do believe that you will not let the uh, history repeat twice or more. Um, as you may know that uh, you just passed a, a motion of uh, the genocide happening in China. So would, how would you um, keep pushing the Five Eyes Airlines to uh, recognize this uh, horrific activities happening in China. And second, uh, as you may also aware that uh, the Confucius Institute, Institute uh, is actually also a threat to uh, the Canadians' education and to our future generations. How would you stop this kind of um, interference in our country? And third, um, it's about a Hong Kong issue. And if we our community uh, promote uh, the Hong Konger uh, identification in the co uh, consensus. Would you support this um, this motion or this uh, if, uh, event? Uh, oh, I would like to hear your um, opinion. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Okay, just making a couple notes here, so I don't I don't forget. So, uh, thank you for your questions. Your your first question was about encouraging other countries to recognize this genocide. Canada and the U.S. has recognized two, two American administrations as well as Canada's parliament. Uh, there is a lot of uh, debate ongoing about this issue in the U.K. Uh, other countries are moving forward on this, and and you know every country has to has to think through uh, the implications uh, of it. But it becomes easier the more countries who step up and do it. So. Uh, the leadership of Canada's parliament here uh, is, I think, uh, going to be be very important, and you know we need to continue to advocate on this. Uh, on the Confucius Institutes, yes, and, and for, for for those who don't know, uh, Confucius Institutes are these um, uh, Chinese state uh, directed, certainly influenced uh, institutions that that kind of embed themselves with institutions of higher learning, and they they present themselves. Oh, you could have a Confucian Institute at your university. It's great. We do uh, Chinese language training, and and uh, and we're you know we'll we'll provide a bunch of money for it. Uh, but they they have ended up being vehicles for significant influence and control by the Chinese government acting through these Confucius Institutes and. Um, you know, um, in many cases, university education policy is controlled at the at the provincial level. Um, you know, in, in Edmonton, uh, there's a Confucian Institute in the Edmonton Public School Board. That's a 
you know, provincial slash school board kind of kind of issue. Um, so, so this just does does speak to the the reality that policies around foreign state infiltration they're not just a federal issue. They require uh, cross jurisdictional collaboration, and you know, people at the provincial level, municipal level, need to be thinking about these issues. So I'd encourage everybody uh, on here to to not just think about that as a federal issue. We generally think security that's at the federal level, and the federal government needs to lead. But there can be collaboration across different jurisdictions as well. I think New Brunswick has recently taken some steps. Uh, around addressing this issue issue there. So something to talk to politicians at all levels about. Um, and, and I, I will say that the name always just gets under my skin, right? Because Confucius um, was such a great thinker and uh, the total antithesis of, of the kind of values articulated by the, the Communist Party and uh, um, you know, I, I, I always encourage everybody to read the analytics by Confucius. It's a short, short, beautiful book, great, great philosophy, um, you know, and, uh, you know, a, a lot of alignment with, uh, with, with the values that, that, uh, that Arnold and I have as well. Um, all right, so the third, the third question was just about a Hong Kong identification. Um, I, I gather that's referring to the, the desire of some people who are, uh, who, who are starting to see themselves as kind of ethnically uh, Hong Kongers as opposed to Chinese and want to identify with a Hong Kong identity as opposed to a, to a Chinese identity. Um, you know, I, I, I understand that some people uh, feel that way. Uh, other people want to identify, identify differently. Um, you know, and I, I think it's, it's good for, uh, for our statistical data collection to be able to give people sort of as many options as possible. It's not an issue I've thought a lot about, but it seems reasonable that people would be able to identify um, their identity in, in, in a way that their ethnicity or their identity that reflects their own sense of, of place instead of having to, to fit that into, um, into into categories that maybe they don't uh, they don't ident identify it with. I'm I'm interested in in learning more about the issue. Well, everyone, I want to thank everyone for coming here. I want to thank Garnet for uh, coming on to the the Zoom meeting tonight and spending his evening with us. Uh, I, this is all of these things are uh, as you scratch the surface of them, you realize that it's all a lot more complicated than it first appears. Um, uh, however, I I get the sense from on this call anyways there's pretty much unanimity around the uh, our relationship with china and and that they are a threat and uh yeah garnet thanks for all the work you do on the the committee the special china canada committee um it's uh, it's important work and yeah it doesn't uh china china is affects all of our lives and the fact that we use a lot of products from china and, and disentangling uh, Canada from China in that in that regard is is going to be um, going to be delicate uh, over the next couple of couple of years I imagine, but uh, look look forward to continuing to work with you on that and uh, and looking forward to feedback from constituents around uh, uh, many of these things. So thanks again everyone for joining us tonight and uh, Garnet, uh, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for hosting a great discussion.